Hej och välkomna till den här digitala författarscenen från Stadsbiblioteket i Malmö. Per Bergström heter jag och är producent för författarscenen. Sedan den fingerade valsegen för Alexander Lukashenko den 9 augusti så har protesterna i Belarus pågått vecka efter vecka. I nu över hundra dagar har människorna fyllt gatorna i fredliga protester med sina krav på fria val och att alla politiska fångar ska släppas. Regimens svar har varit ett allt mer tilltagande grovt våld. Hittills har över 25 000 människor fängslat. Demonstranter har beskjutits med vattenkanoner, gummikulor och chockgranater. I häkterna dit fångarna förs så sker grova övergrepp. Fångar har torterats, våldtagits, misshandlats och till och med mördats. Förtrycket i Belarus är dock inget nytt för den här hösten. Det har pågått sedan Lukashenko blev vald president 1994. Och exempelvis efter valfusksegrarna 2006 och 2010 möttes demonstrationer också med ett övervåld. Aldrig förr har dock den folkliga resningen varit så överväldigande och så enad som den har varit den här hösten. Poeten och översättaren Julia Tsimafeva är en av dem som kontinuerligt har deltagit i demonstrationerna och hennes dikter har också lästs under protesterna. Boken Dagar i Belarus som nu utkommer på svenska i översättning av Ida Börjel är hennes dagboksanteckningar till sin man från den här tiden. Det är anteckningar om protesterna, om våldet, om hur Lukashenko en gång kom till makten, om fängslanden, om rädslan, men framförallt är det en bok fylld av hopp, av gemenskap och som skildrar förändringen till ett framtida Belarus. Skapandet av en ny nation. Vi har idag med oss Juliet Simafeva på länk och hon kommer att prata med författaren och journalisten Kalle Knivele som finns på scenen här i Malmö. Varsågoda. Hello Julia, nice to see you. Hello Kalle. So, uh, before the uh, latest fake elections in, in Belarus, uh, now for uh, four months ago, uh, most people had no special expectations for any change. Uh, and I personally thought that uh, everything, everything would be about the same as usual. Uh, there would be some protests and there would be some repression and then uh, Lukashenko would uh, continue as usual. But uh, this time it was different and uh, we have seen the largest uh, protests since, I think, the fall of the Soviet Union. Why is that? Well, I think, uh, of course, I'm not a, a political analyst or something like that. I'm just a common citizen of a Belarus support, maybe uh, a translator and so on. Uh, but um, analyzing, trying to analyze the situation, I can see the following uh, maybe background condition. First of all, uh, the shift of the generation. I mean, uh, the people in Belarus um, uh, have changed greatly. Uh, a lot of young people have been abroad and a lot of uh, people of my age or a bit el uh, elder also uh, uh, went to Poland or Lithuania. Belarus used to be the champion of uh, 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 Schengen visa for Schengen visas in the world for 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 the percentage of uh, the population. So uh, Belarusians uh, sta uh, have started to get used to freedom, democracy. They saw how the world, how the the life is organized in uh, uh, neighboring countries, and. Um, I think that was one of the points, but uh, another one was, uh, of course, COVID, the situation with COVID. Um, uh, in the spring, uh, Lukashenko uh, was, uh, um, uh, was uh, uh, tried to disregard it, tried to ignore the seriousness of the situation. And um, um, uh, he also uh, uh, let himself to give uh, uh, humiliating comments about the dead people. We, we, we all remember how he, um, um, how um, rude he was. Um, 
and uh, all this uh, uh, made people think that they were left alone with this uh, uh, with the with this disease that they had to struggle and that um, that uh, provoked a huge wave of solidarity uh, people were uh, collecting money, uh, they were crowdfunding for a uh, special uh, uniform, for masks also, for medical workers. Uh, they also started uh, helping each other. There were a lot of volunteers, there was huge volunteer, uh, volunteer movement among Belarusians. And also one of the uh, things connected with COVID was that migrant workers, a lot of migrant workers had to get back to Belarus and to stay here with no work, with nothing to do. And uh, it also, I guess, what was one of the, the reasons. And this, um, um, this, um, this agreement, this satisfaction just uh, grew up were rousing and uh, then in spring we had uh, at the end of spring may and the beginning of june we had a lot of arrests of uh, the most uh, uh, the, the the most famous the most uh, probable uh, candidates for the presidency as uh, Viktor Babarika and Sergei Tikhanovsky and members of their team also they were arrested and uh, then Svetlana Tikhanovskaya came and her personal story uh, about her husband being in jail, she is a housewife, she, uh, she used to be a teacher, she, told, she said, I'm not, she, I was not a politician, and also Maria Kolesnikova and Veronika Tsipkala joined her, uh, and uh, this union, this, also this solidarity, this uniting, it also made, uh, gave Belarusians some uh, um, positive, I don't know, view on life, they, it, it, it gave them some hope, for changes and then uh, the words they said also these three uh, brilliant women uh, being like rock stars on the stage greeting people and they were telling them Belarusians you are incredible we love you you can you can do a lot of things so uh, and it was so contrasting with what Lukashenko was saying about uh, about how uh, all those people were fat or they had other diseases or uh, Belarus is just a small patch of land, he called it. And all these accumulating uh, things from Lukashenko and all these supportive uh, things from uh, uh, three uh, women, uh, they, they made Belarusians um, believe in themselves also. Uh, and uh, uh, we, um, we are just, Belarusians just uh, stand before the mirror, uh, like they, like stu they stood before the mirror and saw themselves and started asking questions who they were and why, why they uh, have been living this way for 26 years already. And maybe also, of course, the brutality, the, the, uh, the scale of violence, uh, that was very high uh, in August days, just after the elections, when we realized uh, this, what happened uh, during those nights in Akrestina or in other prisons across Belarus, we just didn't have words, and it was, and it is a big trauma also for Belarusians. So we've changed greatly now, and I don't believe that there would be any way back. For for Belarusian uh, for Belarusians, uh, I don't know Belarusian character. Let's say this way, or uh, our actions. Even even when Lukashenko stays, Belarusians won't be the same. Uh, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, just before the election, there was this book published with your poem about the grey stone of fear that all Belarusians have been carrying in, in generations and. Uh, what has happened to this fear? Is it still there? Why, why are people coming out now? Mm, yeah. uh, I, I would say that this grey stone, it's uh, from Swedish translation, as far as I understand. In my uh, original uh, ver version, it's just uh, stone of fear. Yeah, but that's, uh, that's okay. Thank you, my uh, translator, Mikhail Nidal, that he added this uh, to uh, this uh, uh, attribute to, to the to the image. As for this uh, poem, I write uh, my uh, last book of poems, Rot, 
And this root, maybe you have that in Swedish, that is root in, in English. Is it? Yeah. So it's also one of the uh, meanings of the, of the title of the uh, book. So uh, this uh, poem is also about fear that Belarusians uh, carry from generation to generation because uh, my ancestors were common village dwellers in Tsarist times. My grandparents were also village dwellers. That but they had to participate, some of them had to participate in the Second World War and, uh, survive, and to survive. Some of them stayed here in the, uh, on the Lusan land, but had to, to struggle here. Uh, and my parents, uh, of course, they, uh, they, they come from, they were raised in Soviet times. Uh, and uh, they still have, I think, uh, that red man Svetlana Alexievich wrote about, and I think that Swedish public uh, uh, have read, of course, uh, uh, Svetlana Alexievich's books and knows what I mean. And so this fear uh, was uh, carried to me. So it was given to me. And as, as I'm now in my active years, I have to do something. And so here's a fear for you, darling. So please feed it. And um, but I think, of course, that this uh, is also about a lot of, uh, almost all Belarusians, uh, not only about my family, my team, but also about all Belarusians. Um, and I would say that, um, first of all, um, I wouldn't say that fear is so, it only is a negative feeling you have. I would say that's, that's a normal reaction of your nervous system uh, to danger, so it it gives you a, it it alerts you that there's danger coming, and uh, we uh, in Belarus uh, have been always living with this danger inside, especially when you uh, you are a free thinking person. Then please keep your uh, mouth shut. Uh, you and uh, uh, this time, I think. If, if, if trying to uh, develop the image, maybe we try to, um, uh, we try to uh, uh, vomit this uh, stone out. I'm not sure whether it worked, but I think that at least we started feeding it less, uh, this uh, stone of fear. And I think it, it's, it's grown less, so. To, to, to get us uh, the possibility to speak, at least. Mm. Yeah. In, in, in this book, in your diary, you write about uh, yourself and your husband going out to demonstrations, and uh, just like so many other people in, in Belarus. How, how do you feel about the fear, about the risks you're taking when you go out? Do you think that you might be arrested? Or of course, uh, uh, when you, you decide to... Uh, um, leave your house to go out on Sunday. So just be, be ready that you, are go they, that you could be arrested. So please prepare for that also. And, uh, and if you go to a demonstration, you have to, uh, you have to get ready for that. You have to take uh, warm clothes. You have to take pills or some medicine if you need them. And um, you have to understand that, yeah, you, maybe you won't get home after that. Uh, yesterday, uh, a friend of mine, a uh, very good musician, poet, and translator, Ulad Lankevich, uh, was arrested for the second time. I wrote about him in the, in the first piece of my diary that he sent Kupalinka, and he was arrested for that. And so yesterday, he was arrested for the second time, and uh, he didn't take a warm uh, jacket with him, and he didn't take medicine he needed. Uh, so still, if you do that every day, every time, sometimes you, you forget. So sometimes you think maybe, no, it, it won't happen this time. So that's how our side, uh, how, how uh, what psychological processes we have inside of us. But still you have to think that that could happen, of course. You, you tell in the book that your own brother was arrested uh, and uh, that you waited for him outside the prison. How, how did this affect his... Uh, uh, feelings about the uh, protests, how did this affect yourself? Uh, of course, I, was, um, I wasn't shocked 
uh, when I got an SMS from him uh, that uh, he, he was taken as he wrote it. Um, I was very, um, of course, nervous and concerned and um, I was trying, we were trying to do our best with his girlfriend and my husband looking for him. But I would say that we were lucky uh, knocking on wood uh, because he was uh, he spent just uh, a day in uh, in a detention center where he was uh, accused and he was punished with just with a fine but not with uh, days of arrest. Uh, I'm still uh, he um, he's still active, let's say so, and I still uh, um, get. Um, I still get concerned about him, and I uh, and and all the time after every Sunday uh, rally, we all check the list of the detained, and we check uh, whether we know the surnames or not. And we always ask our friends. We call them or just uh, send a message on Telegram asking if they're okay. If they're okay, okay. So. That's it. There, there was an interesting detail about these lists of names after arrests in your book. Uh, uh, that actually people from inside the prisons come out with lists of arrested people and give them these names to the uh, volunteers. And I found this uh, surprising because this is something uh, humane from, from inside the system. Uh, how do you feel about this? Is this something that is uh, an initiative from uh, uh, individual people inside the system, or how, why are they doing this? Because this is not actually working uh, to to make the fear greater, as they should mm. try to do. Um, well, of course, I can say that uh, all uh, all the uh, militia or police officers are just uh, uh, servants of evil, um, and to some extent, they are, of course. But uh, at the moment, we have uh, this um, net uh, network of the communication between volunteers and uh, police station officers. So still they, they uh, share this information. They give this list of the detainees. And we have almost uh, all, all of us who take part or took part in the demonstrations, we have uh, these telegram channels of volunteers in our telephones. And we check all these uh, lists of people who have been detained, but also the, the lists of people who are, um, uh, who have been taken to uh, some uh, special police stations, for example, Barauliansky, Partizansky, and all these things. So still there is this um, exchange of information. But I would say staying there, uh, standing there in front of the, the uh, police station where my uh, brother was held, that uh, the volunteer told us about uh, uh, the, the relations between uh, the riot police, so-called cosmonauts, and uh, police officers who are working at these police stations, that there are conflicts even between them. There is uh, the misunderstandings and so, and when the cosmonauts or riot police left the police station, then the police officer went out to us and he, he gave us this list and he told us that uh, your, uh, so your relatives, um, had not been beaten, tortured, and so on, uh, though five or four, I don't remember exactly, uh, of people, uh, of the, the protesters uh, were taken to hospital after these detentions. But I guess they were beaten by the riot police, but not the police officers inside the uh, detention center. So this these situation is very complicated still. And I would say that this Barauliansky police station that my uh, brother was uh, taken to, um, the people so work as their police officers and so uh, they are not so used to to the detainees to be um, the protesters to be uh, taken uh, to that police station it's 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 quite far away it's outside of Minsk yes uh, you also write in the book about this uh, underground performance of uh, a classical play by Janka Kupala uh, about uh, well as I see it, uh, the main character there is a, an opportunist who uh, is ready to serve any master as as long as uh, he's being paid well and treated well uh, by the masters. And this is about uh, the history of Belarus in about a hundred years ago. So uh, 
how do you find, uh, what does this play say to uh, Belarusians today? And if this play were to be written today, uh, who would be the uh, main character? Mm. That's an interesting question. Thank you. But, uh, in this, uh, poor, uh, this play is called Tuteishe uh, in uh, Belarusian or Locals or The Locals, as it can be translated into uh, English language. Um, yeah, the main character is an opportunist and he is uh, shifting between, uh, I mean, he's shifting his views and even his name. Uh, his name is uh, Mikita Znosek, but he changes it to uh, Mikitius Znosek. Uh, sorry, I have that uh, written here. Uh, not to, not to lie anything, not to. Uh, Nikita uh, Znoselov, uh, when uh, Russians came, uh, come to uh, Minsk and uh, Nikitius Znoselovsky when Polish forces uh, uh, occupy Minsk. Uh, and um, this, this problem um, and this uh, image, I guess, uh, has been actual for, for a lot of time, not only 100 years ago, as this uh, shift uh, of power uh, went o on and on, even before uh, 1942, uh, 1924, when the play uh, was first published. And uh, this, it also uh, described the, the way Belarusians live between the East and the West, and how they have to choose, decide, or something like that. Um, and you know, um, as, as um, I wouldn't say that that's so actual now, because uh, even in, in the, during the protest in the previous years, uh, during oppositional rallies in, in uh, 2006, 2010, and uh, in, in other uh, uh, periods, uh, Belarusians, Belarusian opposition used uh, those uh, European Union flags, the demonstration. Uh, uh, and this time, uh, now, we don't have uh, these kind of flags at all. We have only Belarusian flags, white, red, white, and this uh, uh, local communities flags and so. So there is no this, um, Western uh, narrative now, maybe, or Western pro-Western positions, but mm, and uh, at the same time, uh, we didn't have any anti-Russian uh, slogans or anti-Russian uh, um, mm, uh, views. Let's say so. You, uh, there were no of them, but now I guess uh, the situation is uh, getting. Mm, the, the, the trust towards Russia uh, is less and less because of the support, uh, Russia's support, Putin's support of uh, Lukashenko's regime. And I guess uh, Belarusians uh, are getting more hostile towards Russia now. But uh, the, the, um, the uh, views, the... Um, the, the main thing now is not uh, uh, being against Russia, or being, being against West, or being uh, pro-West, or go to, to go to the West, nothing of that kind. Uh, Belarusians are uh, now are pro-Belarusians. So we want to be good neighbors with everyone, with all countries around us, and in Europe and everywhere. But we want to keep our own... Uh, uh, independence. That's the main thing we have. So I would say that Mikita Znosek is the, the character, is an up-to-date character, but I, I guess that this kind of uh, um, work that this play should be written, still there is time for it to be written. I don't know what it's going to be about, what kind of character uh, it's going to be. I think that time will uh, show us. You have another interesting picture of uh, cultural life in Belarus in, in your uh, book about uh, participating in a literary event uh, and suddenly you see that outside the building the, the uh, uh, police are beating up uh, demonstrators and uh, this is uh, something that uh, could be uh, a picture of the whole uh, cultural life of Belarus in, 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 in some periods of time at least, that uh, people 
want to uh, do their own thing and, if possible, ignore what's happening outside. And uh, well, in, well, in this case, uh, you, you can't ignore the uh, system, the regime anymore, because it's coming so near and you see it through a window. Is this something that uh, uh, is uh, a clarification for uh, so many people coming out to protest now? You, you just can't ignore the, the regime, regime anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, uh, that's true that uh, maybe from starting from uh, 2013 until 2018 maybe, um, we people in cultural sphere, in cultural life, in literary field, um, tried to live as if there is a parallel life. So there were two parallel lives, the state uh, and uh, prostate culture. They live their own life and we live our own life. So we have our publishing houses, we have our uh, bookstores, independent bookstores, we have uh, our literary uh, events, we have our literary prizes even, and of course we, we have our literary editions and so. Uh, but then maybe in, and to, uh, in 2017, uh, when uh, there was um, a very brutal dispersion of the protest on the 20, uh, 25th of uh, March when we had uh, uh, so an Independence Day, the Independence Day, the day when the Belarusian, uh, uh, folk, uh, Belarusian uh, People's Republic um, was announced in uh, 1918, so before the, the Belarusian uh, Soviet Republic. And uh, people were, there were not so many people, there were maybe a thousand or more, and uh, people were beaten and uh, detained and so, and uh, a lot of uh, military forces were in the streets. And we, we thought that it was like uh, we uh, had been um, uh, living on the back of a sleeping dragon, and uh, uh, he suddenly woke up, and then we we started uh, thinking about that also. But I would say that uh, common people still lived, common people, okay, uh, ordinary people, people that uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't want to think about the, the uh, injustice and the falsifications and the detentions and the tortures uh, that uh, were uh, in Belarus. Uh, but in 1920, uh, in 19, sorry, in uh, 2020, uh, these ordinary people woke up as well. So, and uh, uh, now we have uh, not only oppositional movement, these people uh, taken to the street, they are not opposition. They are uh, most, of, I would say that most of the uh, population of Belarus understands what is going on now in Belarus and we can't ignore that's true but on the other hand um, the cultural life I would say is ruined now so you said that uh, you wrote this book uh, not in Russian not in Belarusian but in, in English and you couldn't have written it in in in, uh, in Belarusian why is that uh, so the first test was written for uh, the Financial Times I wrote it in English first I didn't want to do that um, but then I found, I guess, uh, a voice for that, a language for that. And uh, when the text was translated into Swedish uh, by Ida Buriel, and uh, I was asked uh, uh, about uh, other texts, about other uh, diary entries by uh, Nordstedt's, uh, by, by Swedish publishing house, um, I started thinking about that and I thought that I would like to write this book and I would like to write this book in English because still I can't find that language, the, the language, not, not the language of language, but it's the writing language style in Belarusian language. And I can't do that now, I guess, as well. And uh, so I, I'm very thankful for this opportunity to Ida and to Nordstedt uh, that I wrote it and in just October. And th this English language on the first, uh, and it gave me the language to write about, uh, but on the other hand, uh, the language of uh, the distance also. 
I got with, the, with this language from the situation I live in. But also it, it gave me an opportunity to speak to a, more, to a broader audience, of course, to the world audience. So maybe uh, in some years, I don't know, I would translate it into Belarusian language also, maybe add in something. You write in the book that uh, sometime before the election, you said to, to a friend of yours that you have no hope left for, for Belarus, and, and your friend was shocked by this. So uh, why was your friend shocked? I think there were many people who didn't have any hope left for uh, change uh, in, in uh, the near future. Mm. Uh, because this friend was uh, from Germany. So, uh, 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 this is a woman uh, much older than me and uh, she is a foreigner, she is from Germany, so uh, she was surprised how uh, uh, a young, not a young of course, but a, a woman in my age uh, that is working with culture, that uh, has her books published abroad and uh, she, she writes poetry and so, uh, why, uh, she, uh, why she, I, uh, don't see any, um, any hope and I, I guess uh, that can't be so easily understood if you are not in Belarusian situation, or if you have not been in Belarusian situation, you have been not following. So for a foreigner, for a normal, let's say, a person from, with Western background, it, it could not be understood. But if you live in Belarus, if you live in Russia, if you live in Eastern Europe, I guess it, it can be understood. But I would say, yeah, that now, still, uh, now, I still hope we have a hope, let's say. That's mm. That was what I was going to ask you uh, as a final question. Do you have hope now and what do you hope for? Uh, we hope for that this blackness and this darkness and this violence and brutality and lies and injustice and falsifications, all this things will go away from Belarus as uh, Belarusian people uh, are ready for the change, I would say. I was not so sure uh, about that in previous years, but now we all see that uh, Belarusians have changed and they want uh, a better future for, uh, for their land, for their country, for their uh, children and for themselves and we want to develop we want to go uh, further and the the Lukashenko's regime is something from the past that uh, we don't want to have anything uh, in common with anymore so. let's hope that thank you thank you thank you Colin.